Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's free webinar, How Convertible Notes Work, with Kevin Smith from Seed Change and Gadiel Morantes from Early Growth Financial Services. Uh, my name is Erica Malsberg, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Early Growth Financial Services, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Uh, if, for those of you who've attended our webinars before, we tend to take questions as we go along and intersperse them throughout the presentation. For this one, we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, we have a lot of content to cover here, and it's our belief that uh, questions you may have earlier on in the presentation will get answered before we're done. So what we're going to do is go straight through the content. Um, you can enter your questions in as we go along if you'd like, um, or you can wait to the end to enter them in, but we probably won't be answering questions until the very end of the presentation. Um, the presentation will run about 40 minutes, so we should have about 20 minutes for Q&A at the end, so hopefully all your questions will get answered. You can also tweet us questions to at EarlyGrowthFS with the hashtag ConvertibleNotes. Um, so you know, if we don't get to them here, we can certainly get to them after through Twitter. Um, we'll also be sending out a, the deck and the recording to you all tomorrow in a follow-up email, so you'll have that as reference. Um, before we get going here, I wanted to first take a moment to uh, introduce our presenters today. First, we have with us uh, Kevin Smith. Kevin's the co-founder and CEO of Seed Change. He's also the founder of The Vault, a startup co-working and incubation space in San Francisco. In his previous lives, uh, he led the development of new iShares products and businesses around the world, including development and introduction of equity and fixed income ETFs and expansion of iShares to Mexico, Australia, Brazil, Chile, Peru, and Colombia. He also ran IPOs, acquisitions, and other transactions for tech companies in Silicon Valley at Davis Polk and Wardwell. And he co-founded and led a business consulting firm in Moscow from startup phase to profitability as the largest consulting group in Eastern Europe. So good morning and welcome to you, Kevin. You still with us, Kevin? <laughs> Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, yeah, you're good, great, yeah. okay, yeah. hello. <laughs> okay, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. And uh, I also wanted to introduce uh, Gadiel. Gadiel Morantes is the Chief Revenue Officer with Early Growth Financial Services. He's an accomplished executive with 15 plus years experience. His vast experience working with founders and as an entrepreneur has given him great insight into what it takes to build successful companies. So hello to you, Gadiel. Hi, Erica. Okay, so um, just can you take a few minutes, Kevin, to, or a few seconds, I guess, to say uh, just a little bit about Seed Change, what you guys do? Seed Change is an online investment platform for early stage companies. We um, ha have a fair amount of experience in working with companies trying to raise funding at the early stages. And, 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 and as any of you who have tried or been raising funding, no, it, it's just a bloody mess of a process. We thought by taking processes and procedures and standards uh, from that work in, in funding for public companies into the private market, we could make this process a much simpler, more transparent, easier, cheaper, and faster process, both for investors and for companies, and that's what we do. Awesome. And, and Gadiel, you want to just say a little bit about early growth? Of course. Um, we are an outsourced accounting firm, uh, really specializing in small to mid-sized tech companies. We're headquartered here in Silicon Valley, San Francisco, um, and have folks on the ground in uh, eight other locations, actually seven other locations throughout the U.S., uh, New York, Chicago, Seattle, Boulder, Austin, and Los Angeles. And the work we do um, ranges and kind of falls into four different categories. First one is tax return preparation, filing, tax consulting, 409A valuation services. And the core business really is the day-to-day -day transactional accounting on an outsourced hourly basis and our CFO consulting services. And those types of services include uh, general account oversight, uh, preparing monthly financials, things of that nature, along with um, helping fun companies who are actively fundraising, growing their business, uh, providing them support around um, building pitch decks, um, financial projections, modeling work, that type of stuff. Um, and we're really excited to have uh, Kevin Smith today. So I'm, I'm even eager to learn a little bit more myself about convertible. Me too. <laughs> okay, great. So let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, Kevin, to just jump right in. 
Okay. I, you know, I'm frankly a little bit astonished that so many people want to know about convertible notes. It's, it's in a way, it, it's kind of a boring topic, and yet it's, it's a really high, uh, highly important topic for early stage companies because nowadays this is the way most early stage funding rounds uh, are done. Um, in, in the past, a convertible note was used for a bridge round. Let's say a company has gone through a Series A, maybe a Series B, isn't quite ready to raise the next round, uh, but needs a little bit of cash. A convertible note was kind of a quick, easy way to raise 500000 bucks or a million bucks to carry all those, those last few months of, until you're ready to raise your, your round. Um, it's now totally the norm all across the country uh, for early stage funding, unless you happen to be in uh, the rest of the world, you know, kind of outside the the major uh, the major tech hubs uh, of the country, and you know, obviously that actually comprises a good part of the United States. And and in that great middle, um, we found over the past few years that an enormous number of investors, by far the majority of investors, are not very excited about convertible notes and often will refuse to raise funding. Uh, uh, to to, uh, to provide funding using convertible notes. We'll talk a little bit more about why that is and what some of the response might be if that's where you do need to raise funding. Uh, but on the coast, it, it turns out over the past four years or so, about 93% of all early stage rounds are done using convertible notes. So um, you'll, you'll find that people use them regularly for seed rounds. They still get used for bridge rounds. Sometimes people will use, issue convertible notes sort of as a supplement to a round you're already doing. You might be raising a Series A, uh, three million bucks, and right after you close, maybe somebody wasn't able to get in in time, but you find somebody who wants to drop in another couple hundred thousand bucks and you'd like to have that investor. Uh, the way to do that is probably going to be to issue a convertible note just to that investor. So uh, part of the reason uh, this works the way it works is a, if you look at the next slide, the startup funding cycle shows it, the way this generally uh, plays out for most companies, or at least for most companies that make it all the way to the right side of the curve. Um, you early on are trying to raise funding often in a very kind of haphazard way. You're trying, it's not a formalized round the way this used to be 15 years ago when um, even your very first round um, there was kind of a clear laid out process for raising funding. You pr produced a pitch deck, you got meetings uh, on Sand Hill Road and you walked up and down Sand Hill Road pitching as many VCs as possible until you got your five million bucks or, or whatever that first round was. That's just not the way we, we do funding anymore for early stage. Um, invest uh, VCs don't typically do early stage rounds anymore. Their funds are so large that they uh, are able to deploy only larger amounts. And, 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 and as a result, the process has really morphed. Um, and, and part of that morphing has come about through it being much less common to issue stock early on and much more common to issue um, uh, convertible notes to angels um, the friends and family, or what is sometimes now called friends, families, and fools. Um, other people might consider that uh, addition a bit redundant, uh, but that early stage of funding now is almost exclusive. So the weird thing about convertible notes is, um, and, and, and here, you know, try to think, try, try not to, try to, to categorize everything is as, hey, this is debt. Um, because it's technically debt, but it really acts like equity, and it's meant to act like equity. It, it, it's just sort of dressed up in a debt costume. It is technically debt, and therefore must have certain features of debt, like it must um, pay interest to the note holder, and it does have a particular term when, when the note must mature. But it really behaves mostly like stock, in the sense that you know, fundamentally what investors are looking for is not a coupon, as they might be when they were looking to invest in bonds. They're not looking for cash payments over a period of years, uh, um, at, followed by the repayment of principal. That's not at all what an investor wants. An investor really wants a piece of the company. And so uh, what they're really trying to get is stock, and, and they'll get stock when the note converts into equity. So a way to think about this is it's basically an IOU. 
Um, it's, it's, it's a legal IOU that will function as um, I, the repayment will be made in stock rather than in, in, in cash as you know, sort of a typical IOU would be. So let's think about uh, a, 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 just a kind of an overview of convertible notes by looking at it and the features, advantages, and benefits. And this particularly comes at it from the point of view of companies. So what's, what, what, what are the features of a convertible note that really, really stands out, um, especially compared to doing an equity deal and a stock purchase agreement? They're short, they're simple, they're really flexible. Um, the, you don't have to do a company valuation. And the terms are pretty standard over the past few years. Um, it's not that common to see terms that vary much within a particular band. In fact, um, when we started C Change, we decided that we would use only convertible notes with a standardized set of terms, non-negotiable, and the terms are kind of middle of the road. Uh, they're, they're, they're a median set of terms, and as proof that, in fact, people don't much care um, about out most of the terms of a convertible note. Although it's possible in the Sea Change platform to download the convertible note, nobody ever has. And in fact, very few users have ever even looked at it. So, um, next slide looking at what are the advantages of convertible notes? They're short, that leads to the ability to do closings pretty quickly. Um, the document is, oh, typically three, four, or five pages for a note purchase agreement a couple of pages for the note itself, um, and the note is the actual security, like a stock certificate. Um, in this case, it's a note certificate. Um, and, and the fact that it's short compared to a stock purchase agreement, which is probably gonna be 30 or 40 pages, uh, means you can, you can produce these pretty fast. They're really simple. Terms are almost all boilerplate, so although it's three or four or five pages long, um, there's probably only about six sentences that really vary from, from note to note. Um, that means that they're a lot cheaper to get produced by your law firm than stock purchase agreement is. Really flexible in the sense that you, you don't have to create an entire, um, an entire fundraising campaign culminating in the execution and, uh, of, of an agreement and the transfer of funds, you do it one by one. Um, it, it's very typical to find an investor who says, I, I love this and, and yes, I'm, I'm willing to write a check for 50,000 bucks. Uh, you can close that investor tomorrow, even, even though you may continue raising funding based on this convertible note, based on the very same terms of this convertible note for several more weeks or, or maybe even months. Um, it doesn't have a valuation and I think that's an extraordinary advantage um, for a, a company early on because you save the negotiation. Um, you don't have to negotiate, which is what you spend an enormous amount of time negotiating uh, when you're raising, um, uh, raising and issuing stock. Similarly, uh, the terms are pretty standard. Um, it, it saves uh, the need to negotiate term by term. Uh, bottom line, uh, this really allows you to save a fair amount of time and a fair amount of money in, in issuing convertible notes as opposed to doing a stock deal. Um, a quick close means you can turn these around really fast. You're gonna save a lot of legal fees. Um, honestly, I, I, I would say that anything more than three or four or five thousand uh, dollars to do a series of convertible notes is probably too much in legal fees. Um, and and um, if you had a bit of experience, you could even do this yourself. It's not hard. Um, you can close these anytime. It lets you do kind of just in time funding. Um, you need to raise. Um, 250,000 bucks right now, I, this, is, this is the way to do it. It's quick and easy and probably it'll take you a lot less time uh, than it would to produce and organize and manage and complete a, an equity funding round. Because you don't have to negotiate a valuation standard terms. Just to, just to chime in, sorry, uh, just to chime in really quickly. Um, 
when when we're working with companies it's funny the silicon valley in san francisco you know in terms of just touching on your previous slide about um the notes being kind of non-negotiable and it's very very standard terms when we get outside of silicon valley that's when i sometimes see some of these uh pockets where we will get a convertible note or we will look at a at an investor uh, wanting to tweak a little bit of that language um, is that what you see as well Absolutely. You get out of Silicon Valley, and it's a whole different ball game. And 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 I usually say, uh, the farther you are from Silicon Valley, uh, the less, the the less, uh, the lower the quality of legal advising you get around startup um, startup companies and startup investors. And uh, you'll you'll find a lot of investors. You know, I I I think that investors in you know generally in the great Midwest. Are kind of still in the 1990s when it comes to thinking about investing in early stage companies. For instance, I, I've heard people define early stage companies in places um, like the Upper Midwest and and you know farther sort of the Eastern Midwest as a company that's got at least two million dollars in revenue, is profitable, has been around at least four years, and has audited financial statements. None of which I consider. Um, a typical of an early stage company, and none of which I think most people in in Silicon Valley or New York or you know other pockets of uh, of, of real tech finance would consider uh, typical. Um, finishing up on the benefits of convertible notes, the ability to punt the negotiation. Evaluation to the next round is, I think, a significant advantage for an early stage company. Think about it like this: um, valuation is really, really difficult. Uh, the way you normally value a company based on cash flows, based on revenue, based on multiples or, or, or certain ratios, and based on comparatives. It's really hard to compare um, a, a, an early stage company because, by definition, they're kind of a new experiment. Uh, every early stage company is kind of a new experiment, and you certainly don't have several years of cash flows or revenue to uh, to draw conclusions from. So uh, it, it, it's a very difficult process, and almost invariably, the investor you're talking to about about valuing your company has done this many more times than you have, and you're going to be a, typically at a pretty significant advantage a disadvantage when it comes to negotiating valuation. Uh, I think it's you're always better off to push that off to ooh, a little bit later round when you have to do it when you're issuing equity. And kind of similarly with the standard terms, uh, by and large, I think there's almost no need to negotiate any of the terms of a convertible note. Uh, figure out what terms make sense for you, your company today, and the place where your company is and where you're going to be raising funding. And uh, the need to negotiate, there shouldn't be much need to negotiate. Uh, it, it is kind of what it is. And, and, and the reason we got to this conclusion you know, at Sea Change, is we thought about, hey, when you're investing in in an online platform like Schwab or E-Trade, um, every time you order a trade order, you're actually executing a legal agreement. Now, you, the investor, you may not have really thought about that. I'm willing to bet you've never looked up all the legal agreements that you're executing by virtue of pressing that um, that trade button. And if, even if you did, you couldn't do anything about them. They're non -stand they're, they're totally standard. They're non-flexible, non-negotiable. We took the same approach, and uh, we found that uh, that investors were very receptive to that to that uh, to that pitch. So, quick overview of how this process works, and it's so much simpler than it is if you're raising if you're raising equity, raising equity, raising equity. Few steps. Determine what you need to raise, what's, what's the right amount? Um, typically, it's something in the neighborhood of 500 to a million, uh, 500,000 to a million dollars. What's the minimum investment you want to accept from investors? 
you really, you, you know, ideally, you probably have about four different investors, each putting in $250,000. You're probably not living in the ideal world, at least when it comes to uh, this round. So what is it you'd be willing to take? Uh, you'll, you'll probably find that there, there are, are a fair number of investors who want to put in about $50,000. Uh, probably even more willing to put in $25,000. You'll certainly find investors willing to write checks for five or $10,000. The question is, do you want to try to collect, you know, a hundred of those people in order to get to your round? The answer is probably no. You don't want to bulk up your cap table like that. And I'll tell you, managing an investor base is administratively difficult managing an investor base of somewhat unsophisticated investors can be even harder and and so you're probably going to decide that your minimum investment for your round is going to be something higher than ten thousand dollars at least in most cases once you decide on those you'll need to agree on you know sort of amongst yourselves and with your lawyer on what the terms should be for the note, and we're about to talk about what terms matter. And you'll provide those to an investor, and, and, and it most certainly should be an accredited investor only. Um, and to, to the investor, when, when the time is right, uh, you should be able to agree very quickly on those terms, sign and date the note purchase agreement and the note, you are the only one signing the note because this is the security being issued by the company. It is not an agreement. It's simply a security. Uh, you'll exchange the note purchase agreement of the note for the money, and then you should add the note holder to your cap table. Um, it obviously, the note holder is obviously not a stockholder, but, uh, but it does, he, she does show up on the cap table on the deck page. And as we discussed a bit earlier, uh, you know, this is the process because it's so short, it's pretty simple. You can just wash, rinse, and repeat over and over and over. So you can, you can close your first uh, investment as soon as you can. And you might not get another note uh, for a couple of weeks. That's totally fine. And you might continue this process over six months. And, and that's okay, too. Um, you don't have to have a deadline by, um, uh, under which you've got to have all of the funding received. Okay, let's talk about terms. They're only really four uh, that actually anybody cares about. Um, I, other than, of course, um, you know, your name, the name of your company, uh, and the amount you're raising. Um, beyond that, the terms, that can vary a little bit, but over the last four or five years have become almost standard in Silicon Valley, New York, and, and, and other uh, tech areas, tech finance areas in the United States. And those four terms are interest rate, the maturity date, the discount of the note cap. And we're going to talk about them sort of in increasing uh, levels of complexity. Interest rate, pretty straightforward. It's uh, a, a convertible note, has to include an interest rate because it's debt. It, uh, this is a required feature for even for tax purposes. The IRS requires it. You got to pay interest. It's always simple interest, not compound interest. Uh, there are really only two ways of determining what the interest rate should be. I've seen both. Either pick a number, and it's a fixed number. And um, it, you know, it, ten years ago, that number was something like ten percent. Uh, the last few years, it's been more like 5%. I could say with 1% or 2%, given how low rates are right now and, and uh, you know, historically low rates, not really expected, I think, by most people, um, even economists, um, to change too much in the next several months. So it, you probably wouldn't get much pushback if you if, if you included a 1% rate or a 2% rate in a convertible note. Remember, investors aren't actually trying to buy debt. They're really trying to buy a piece of the company. Um, the other way of determining the interest rate is choose some sort of standard interest rate like LIBOR. 
and you pay a little bit above that. Maybe it's 1% above LIBOR. Um, I've seen that reasonably commonly as well. It, 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 it makes sense, except for the fact that investors really aren't looking for a, a, a cash flow out of this investment. They're looking for stock. They really don't actually care much about interest. And f fixing it to a fluctuating rate, it just becomes a pain in the butt And when it comes time to calculate, calculate how much interest you owe people. Um, because you're going to have to calculate based on the LIBOR day by day. I always go back to a simple number, something like 5%. Interest doesn't get paid out in cash. It doesn't get paid out um, monthly as, say, a bond might. Um, it's paid only at the time of conversion to stock, and it's paid out in stock, not cash. So a simple example, let's say I've got a $100,000 note. I've been paying five, uh, I'm paying 5% interest exactly 12 months after I issued that note. We do our equity round. I'm gonna owe that investor $105,000 worth of stock. Interest begins to accrue on the date the note is signed, so do pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, if you sign a note today, but you don't actually get the check for six weeks later, uh, you're really, you've really signed up to pay that investor interest on that six week period. And you know, frankly, the investor didn't earn it. Um, it, it it's not gonna be a huge amount. It's not worth losing sleep over, uh, but, but it is worth trying to, trying to tie uh, try tie the execution date, date to the time you're actually receiving the money, and um, and, and then interest gets paid um, as I said only when the note is converted to stock. Maturity date it's a pretty simple uh, date. People typically use a 12 or 18 months. Um, I would always recommend a little bit later date. It doesn't mean that you can't convert to stock before then, but it means that by that date, you must have converted the stock, or as the terms of the note will say, say repaid the investor the cash plus interest. Um, and, and again, this is one of the features of a convertible note. It's debt, it acts like debt. Uh, but again, investors really are looking for a piece of the company. They don't care too much whether they're gonna get that stock uh, in 12 months or 18 months, and just, to be a little simpler, to eliminate, I hope, that speed bump that you might hit if you're not ready to raise a round in 12 months, I'd recommend pushing it back to, to a later date. So 12, 18 months is a much better timeline. At the maturity of the note, um, you either have to convert or repay. What happens if uh, the term is 18 months and things haven't gone quite as well as you thought they would. Revenues haven't uh, grown nearly as fast. You have, you think, sorted it out. Um, you finally reached product market fit. You're about to be ready to ramp up, but you're not ready for a Series A yet. And in fact, it's gonna be maybe six or eight or nine months before you're ready. What do you do? Well, you, as, you need to go talk to your investors. Let them know, they should already know, but let them know if they don't, the situation you're in, why you're in that situation, and um, propose the, that you amend the note purchase agreement to extend the date. It's a very simple process. It should be a one-page amendment that includes mostly boilerplate and, uh, and, and, and a sentence replacing the sentence in the original note purchase agreement uh, about the term, and it'll say something like, um, by, by this amendment, the term is extended to a date, you know, a, a date that is maybe 12 months after the original date. Um, it's pretty uncommon to find an investor that won't agree to that. And, 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 and this is just the practical state of things, no matter the, the fact that this is debt and you have an obligation, a contractual obligation to convert or repay by a particular date. The reality is if you haven't converted, meaning you haven't done your, your Series A, it's probably because things haven't gone as well as you would like. You probably therefore don't have the money to repay. So practically speaking, the only real option for an investor is to agree to extend the term. 
uh, what happens if an investor doesn't understand uh, you know, common sense um, and demands repayment? Well, that could trigger uh, bankruptcy. Let's say you've got an investor that, that uh, wants 100000 bucks. You've only got $12,493 in the bank as of today. Uh, what do you do? I, the investor insists on being repaid. He needs to understand that he's not going to be repaid. You don't have the cash to do it. If he takes legal action, he's going to force the company into bankruptcy, meaning you would have to sell all of your assets and repay each investor in in um, in amount of investment. So best case scenario, he may get back a couple thousand bucks out of that hundred thousand dollar investment because even if he got twelve thousand four hundred ninety three or whatever that number I made up was uh, bucks in the bank, he's not going to get all of that. Uh, he's only getting, going to get a proportion of it uh, in in uh, in relationship to the total amount of outstanding notes. So it's pretty rare. Uh, in fact, I think I haven't heard of it in years and years that an investor uh, isn't able to see uh, see the light and, and the ration and freely agree to extend the note. And I think to that point, Kevin, that's where you that's really where see the really unsophisticated investor or the, the non-tech investor that's actually used to investing in these types of companies. Oh, you're totally right. And you know, this this in, in my mind is is a warning sign. Um, an, an investor, and and I hate to pick on people from the Midwest um, because I spent a lot of my life in, in that part of the world. But this is this is really the way uh, the the funding market for early stage companies is in that part of the country. Uh, an investor, even if you're able to convince a Kansas City investor to accept a convertible note, it's pretty likely that he's going to take a pretty hard stance toward adhering to the terms of that note. Um, so uh, that makes me a little bit uneasy when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm negotiating with an investor early on. Um, if I get a sign that this is that kind of investor, I'd probably rather forego that investment at the uh, at that point, and 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 take investment from somebody who really is looking at this the way um, I think investor ought to be be perceiving it, which is again an attempt to buy stock in the company, not a debt instrument that you're going to collect principal and interest on. Discount. This is where it starts to get a little more interesting. And it's interesting because the discount plays together with the convertible note cap, which we'll discuss next. Um, an investor in an early stage expects, absolutely rightfully, to get some sort of, of, of payment for the additional risk that he's taking on vis-a-vis -vis investors at the Series A round. So while it is entirely common that we do convertible notes at this stage, conversion into equity happens at the time you issue a next meaningful round of equity. And conversion happens at the price that is negotiated for the Series A with a bit of a kicker for those early investors. One way that those early investors get some kicker is they get to convert at a discount. So let's say the equity round prices shares at a dollar per share. It's typical that the early, the early investors using convertible notes get a 20% discount. They're going to convert it in at 80 cents a share, not a dollar. And that's entirely fair and, and right. Um, I, again, they were the first ones to buy into this company when it barely even existed. They took on a lot more risk than the A round investors are taking on, and they certainly should be getting equity at, at a better price. Um, the way, the, the normal rate, and this has been typical for a long time, it's been 20%, and, and, and that is, absolutely um, the normal rate, most people consider that a reasonably fair amount. 
in the last year or 13, 15 months, we've seen a trend in Silicon Valley very kind of paralleling the, the trend in what a lot of people think are excessive valuations in middle and late stage private companies. The trend with convertible notes is a lot of people are issuing notes, a lot of companies are issuing notes with 15% discount or 10% discount. I've even seen 0% discount. In my mind, this is a game that's not worth playing. It, it, it's trying to be a little bit too clever, um, trying to save a few bucks. Uh, the truth is that converged, in, uh, even if you've raised a million bucks early on, uh, you're not giving up an enormous amount of the company. And that additional few percent that you're trying to save just probably isn't worth the trouble. Um, and, and it will be trouble because it will raise questions, it will raise protests with investors. If you're an incredibly hot company, perceived as an incredibly hot company, that may work. And, and, and maybe it should even work. Uh, but if you're not uh, trying to do anything other than 20%, it's just going to raise speed bumps in the, in the investment process. It's going to cause a, a certain number of investors to walk away. And you're going to end up spending more time and, 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 and ultimately money um, trying to, put, to complete this funding round than I think is worthwhile. Next to the convertible note cap, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about note caps um, because they're, they're, they're kind of funky. Um, the way to think about a convertible note cap, uh, first of all, it is not a valuation. You, you will hear this frequently, that people think the convertible note cap, investors, even investors who've done this before, think of a convertible note cap as a valuation, and therefore they want to negotiate it. It's not a valuation. And, and if they're thinking about it as a valuation, they're thinking about it entirely wrongly. And it's a sign that this is an investor that may not be um, sophisticated and experienced enough in investing in early stage technology companies to come on board uh, your company. What it is, is dilution protection. And what it says is that no matter the valuation you negotiate in a Series A round, investors at the convertible note stage are going to convert their stock as if that valuation were the same as the convertible note cap. So let's say, just to, to take a simple example, let's say you issued notes at with a note cap of two and a half million dollars. And let's say you had pretty darn good success over the course of the next several months and you got to series A and at series A stage your company was valued at ten million dollars the note holders are going to convert stock into stock as if the company were valued at the Series A round at $2.5 million. That is, they're going to get four times as much stock as they would um, without a note cap. Now, this is actually, I think, a very good thing for investors and ultimately, really, a very fair thing for, for companies to grant. Because what it does is it, it forces the investor to choose. An investor doesn't get to take advantage of the discount and the convertible note cap. He gets one or the other. And so naturally, he's going to take whichever is most advantageous. And so if you issue notes with a $2.5 million cap and you did an equity round with a two and a half million dollar valuation. The investor has to choose, do I want to convert under the cap or do I want to convert under the discount? In this scenario, he's, he's going to get more shares if he converts under the discount. The note cap guarantees that no matter how wildly successful you are, he, he's going to be able to convert within the same narrow range. The good thing for the company is that this really aligns incentives between investors and, and, and the founders. You want to get your valuation is up probably within reason as high as you can on a Series A, and so does your so do your early investors because it's in their it's in their interest as well. So think about it in the opposite sense. What if you don't have a cap, an investor who comes in with a convertible note cap of two and a half million dollars 
really doesn't want your valuation in the equity round to be any higher than two and a half million dollars. In fact, he would prefer that we're a one million dollars because he's still going to convert with a twenty percent discount. And the lower the discount, sorry, the lower the valuation, the more shares he's going to get. Uh, so the incentives are entirely cross purposes. Um, not 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 a good thing because it's likely that later investors are going to know or perhaps even talk to earlier investors about this investment. What you don't want is the note holders um, dissing the company and, and trying to talk down valuation. It also incents, you know, so that's, that's, that's kind of the stick. The carrot is that it incents the, 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 these investors uh, to do everything they can to support you, to help you move along, um, particularly when it comes to raising funding. They really want to talk up valuation because it's, it's in their interest just as it is in yours. Over the past several years, maybe four or five, in Silicon Valley, the median note cap settled on something close to about four and a half million dollars. And then about 12 or 15 months ago, we started seeing in Silicon Valley um, just crazy things happening with convertible note caps. We started hearing of people doing, people with, with, without a, a product in use, no revenue, um, with expected revenue sometime down the road, still issuing convertible notes at with, with a note cap of 10 million or 12 million or 14, I even heard 18 million, in some cases, no cap at all. I think this is again trying to be too clever, um, it really not worth the couple percent of the company that it, that it may save you. Uh, it, it really isn't fair um, to both sides to issue notes with, with no cap at all, meaning the investor is only gonna get 20% discount, although if you think you're able to issue notes with no, no no cap at all, you may also think you, you don't have to give a, a discount, it puts you in a position of, uh, of a much harder negotiation with an investor. It says to an investor uh, that you think that this pie is not all that big and you're trying to retain all of it for yourself. It sets up a, a set of incentives and a relationship that's probably going to be a bit controversial and difficult to manage going forward. I, I, I think you're buying a lot more than a couple percent of the company and what you're buying is really not in your best interest. So my sense has always been try to find a number that that, that appears to be fair to both parties. Um, I still think something in the neighborhood of four million dollars for an early stage company with a product already in use with some revenue is about the right number. Um, and, and, and again, sure, you might be able to negotiate a five or a six or seven million dollar cap, but it's probably not worth the time and trouble that it's going to take to do it. Kevin, before, before we move on here, um, we have a clarification question. And maybe you can mute yourself because I'm hearing a echo and that might help just while I'm talking. Um, okay, so Alex wants to know, you, you know, you say here investor chooses to convert using either the note cap or discount, not both. He's asking, is that mathematically true or does the investor literally have to choose whether they want to pick the discount or the cap? That's a pretty good question. You, you don't typically go to an investor and say, look, I'm about to do a series A round. Here are the terms. What would you like to do? You calculate it mathematically. You tell the note holder, I'm about to do an equity round. Um, here's how this plays out. Uh, because the valuation as, is at this level, obviously you'd like to convert under the cap, which will produce this number of shares for you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks. And we're about to walk through some examples of just how this plays out. I think it's helpful to see it on a spreadsheet um, and, and, and to see um, how this operates. So on the next slide, um, this is a scenario in which um, we've got, uh, you're raising $575,000 and you happen to have eight and a half million shares 
currently outstanding, already issued to employees and founders. You're trying to, uh, uh, trying to raise $575,000 at a note cap of four and a half million bucks. Like most notes, this will convert um, on an equity investment of a certain number. The, t the number typically is one and a half million dollars most often, uh, and that's what the term is here. The calculation here it ignores the interest, which also has to get thrown in here, and also, also ignores the fact that you might already have an option pool, and, and that will change the calculation a bit. So just to try to streamline it, keep it simple, $575,000 note, note cap of $4.5 million, standard 20% discount. The Series A investment is at one and a half, is, is one and a half million bucks. And you know things haven't been brilliant. You're 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 being valued at four and a half million. What happens? Well, if you valued it at the discount, you can see how that plays out for both types of investors. Under the discount column, the Series A investors naturally they're putting in one and a half million. Um, on a four and a half million dollar valuation, after the close, they're going to own 25 percent of the company, and uh, that plays out to 44 cents per share for them. Using the discount for the investor, um, taking a 20 percent discount, uh, that equates to an okay return for the investor, 1.25x. No, nothing anybody's going to get excited about, or uh, or, 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 or tell the investor's spouse over dinner at night, um, but you know it's it, it's not it's not awful, and 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 it's it, it equates to 11.998 percent of the of the company post close. Look at what happens if the note holders converted under a cap again at a four and a half million dollar valuation. Um, in this scenario, they're going to end up converting at a 46 cent. Uh, per share rate. Remember, they're not using a discount, so there's no 20% off sale here. They're converting uh, as if the company were valued at four and a half million dollars, which it is valued at four and a half million dollars. So they're converting at exactly the same price as the Series A investors gives them a 1x return. Uh, they'll end up with nine and a half percent of the company. I, not great. Certainly, an investor was looking for more than that um, at that early stage, more than one x return, and um, and and so the investor would convert here using the discount, the twenty percent off, giving a little bit better return. On the next slide, let's let's look at a better, a little bit happier circumstance. Let's say that in fact, in in, in the twelve months since you did your early stage round, things have gone actually very nicely. And you've been able to achieve a thirteen and a half million dollar valuation for this round. Still, one and a half million dollar investment. Still, eight and a half million that shares outstanding. Um, and and the terms of the original note same. Look under the discount. Um, given that the the Series A investors post close will have ten percent of the company, they're going to end up with a share price of a buck fifty, with a discount. That gives the note holders a buck twenty. Uh, they'll convert at a funny one point two five x return, same as they would have converted under the note. Sorry, under the under the discount previously. Uh, you know, again, not terrible. Uh, nothing to, uh, uh, to 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 go telling anybody about though. And uh, they'll the, the note holders collectively will own 4.79% of the company, a dramatically different amount than they would have under the lower valuation. So you see here, um, they're going to get 4.79% if the valuation is 13.5 million. They would have gotten 11.9% if the valuation is 4.5 million. You can see why they really want your valuation at the Series A round to be very low if they've only got a discount. However, if they convert under the cap. A pretty similar story for the the equity um, investors at the Series A. They're still going to end up with 10% of the shares, um, same same round, same same amount as they would uh, using a uh, using the discount, of course. The share price for them is a buck 39, but using the cap, so converting the note holders as if the valuation were four and a half million. 
is a much happier outcome for them. They'll get 11.5% of equity, share price of 46 cents, much closer to what the share price would be if the valuation were four and, four and a half million. In fact, it's exactly the same. And produces a return of 3x, and if that's 12 months later, I, that's going to be a, a reasonably happy investor. So you can see why, you can see how this works. It protects the note holders from excessive dilution, and it keeps their return within a pretty narrow band. So under four and a half. At a $13.5 million valuation, they're going to convert using the cap. They're still going to have 11.5 million, uh, sorry, 11.5% of the company. I, that number is going to fluctuate a little bit depending on what the valuation is. It's never going to be very far from 10 or 11% um, for, um, for a note holder, whether he's using the discount or the cap. And that's exactly the purpose of the cap, protecting um, from excessive dilution. Now, I think it might be helpful. Um, we've got one more slide. I want to talk a little bit about the downside of convertible notes. They're not all. Per they're not totally perfect. They're not perfect because they're they're a mismatch. They're debt uh, masquerading. Uh, sorry, their equity masquerading as debt. And as we all know, uh, investors really aren't looking for a coupon here. They really want to own a piece of the company. So it's not a perfect match. Debt requires interest payments. It's not going to be a huge amount these days, but the fact is this is not what investors are trying to buy. They don't really give a damn about the interest, so in a way, why pay it if you don't have to? Um, and then as we talked about, the debt is, it is a kind of contractual agreement to repay the debt, so you know, if you can't, well, it, it's probably not, um, not tragedy, but it is a bit of a speed bump. Um, so all, for all of those reasons, people have very recently um, in Silicon Valley created instruments that actually look and act more like stock. Um, they really are an agreement to issue equity. Um, that is not a debt agreement. A, one goes by the acronym of SAVE, a simple agreement for future equity. I, they, they, do, they have all, almost all of the advantages of convertible notes. They're short, they're simple, um, they're easy. The terms are pretty standardized, non-negotiable. The only downside, I think, for using safes is that very few people have heard of them, and you'll find a lot of investors are reluctant to uh, to make an investment at this stage using a using an instrument they're not familiar with, because in order to do that, they're going to feel compelled to have their lawyer review it. So that's going to be a few thousand dollars out of their pocket. And they're just not going to be willing to pay a few thousand dollars to uh, out of their pocket in order to invest fifty thousand bucks in your company. So you're going to find still that a lot of people um, who are comfortable with convertible notes aren't going to be comfortable with safes, and you may still want to default to a convertible note. Okay. That's the end <laughs> of the overview of convertible notes, but I bet there's a question or two. There's a, a ton of questions. And again, I'm, I'm hearing my echo through your computer, I think. So we have seven minutes here, and uh, we'll just try and get through as many as we can. Uh, so first of all, people were asking if you could give those example spreadsheets um, that you showed. Is there any way to send that to the folks on the call as an Excel spreadsheet? Do you have that as a template that I could have to send out to everyone? Sure, why not? Okay. I made it up. Uh, the template myself, um, and so if there are mathematical or spreadsheet errors, um, you should expect that. I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, so let's just kind of try and race through these with, with your 30-second answer, and we'll try and do these. So first of all, with value caps, are they pre- or post-money value? I still have you there? Not sure I totally understand the question. The convertible note cap is is a term of the convertible note that is issued obviously well before you determine a valuation in your equity round. It is not uh, a valuation itself. It acts at the time of conversion. Um, it acts on 
um, let's see how I say this, um, it acts on the valuation of the company. Ah, so the conversion, got it. I think I understand the question. It's a mathematical question. It, 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 you're, you're taking the, pre, um, the, the pre-money valuation um, in, in terms of calculating how many shares somebody's going to get. Okay, great. I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if we should have a discussion about how we're going to answer all these questions because <laughs> there's a ton of them. We're supposed to end in five minutes. Um, you know, I don't know if folks are willing to stay on or if Kevin, Gadiel, you guys have time or if we should follow up in an email with answers to these questions. Should we? Uh, I have three proposals. One, I, I can certainly stay another 10 minutes. Um, two, um, I'm happy to, uh, to take email questions, but if they're a lot, it, it may take a while to respond to them. Um, and three, we could um, schedule another sort of webinar uh, devoted solely to answering questions. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, let's let's stay on for 10 more minutes for those who can stay. We'll try and get through them. And folks, you see the contact information up here. So if we don't get to your question, um, feel free to reach out to Kevin or Gadiel and, and they'll answer as they can. Um, okay, so this question from Kojo, he's saying, say you're raising 500,000 of convert and you have 200,000 committed so far from a few investors. Can you start using that money right away or do you have to wait to close the entire round? Absolutely not. That's one of the great things about convertible notes is it's, it's just-in-time funding. Um, as soon as you close on a note and receive the money, you go. Um, and you might, you might stretch that process out for six or eight months. Totally fine. Investors expect it. Great. Uh, in terms of the, um, the time frames, what do you, th you suggested, I think, 18 months it was. What do you think of longer time frames, like multi-year? Do you have thoughts about that? Um, uh, yeah, it, it depends on the state. Uh, this is a tax. This is a tax law issue. Um, in, in some states, uh, it's you run into tax issues with longer terms, uh, depending on how much longer. Nineteen months, I don't think is uh, is a problem in, in in jurisdiction I know of. Um, but but thirty six months is in, in maybe every jurisdiction. I don't know. So uh, that's that's the that's the that's the problem and why people typically settle on eighteen months. Okay, great. Um, are the founders personally re uh, responsible? They're liable to repay if bankruptcy is filed. I sure hope not, but that depends on uh, how you structure the company. Um, if you've incorporated as a C corporation, um, then you're protected by the corporate entity, and your your personal assets are protected by the corporate entity. Um, if you haven't, if you're a sole proprietorship, or if you've done bad things in terms of mixing finances, mixing the business uh, of uh, business accounts and personal accounts, uh, th then you may give the possibility for an investor to um, you know, get behind that, that corporate entity to your personal assets. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So if you have several investors in the convert round, can they have different valuation caps in that single raise? Well, they can, um, and and this is one of the this is again one of the one of the advantages of a convertible note is that it, that it's so flexible. And here's the way I've done it, and the way I've often seen it done, and the way I recommend that companies do it. Let's say, uh, you know, in, in the ideal world, you'd be able to raise that whole million dollars that you're trying to raise within 30 days. In the ideal world, almost never happens. So what's going to happen is you're going to get fifty thousand bucks, and then you're going to get a hundred thousand bucks in your first month. At 25 and 50 in the second month, and, and so on, and you're going to you're going to use that money as time goes on. Uh, right, right. As soon as you get the fifty thousand dollar check, you're going to deploy that capital immediately, probably. Um, we 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 hope that because you're deploying that capital immediately, that there's progress being made. So by the time that last convertible note holder comes in as an investor, eight months after you started raising your round, hey, you've already launched your product. You've already got um, decent revenue growth. In fact, you've launched version two of your product, and you, you've gotten um, great, uh, great press. Your company is actually, you know, farther along in the process. And although no note cap is not a valuation, it's entirely fair and makes uh, makes great sense that they are going to convert at a at a higher cap because your equity round is probably a lot closer than it is. Um, for the very first note holder. 
So yes, it's entirely typical to change that term as you go along. You might start with $4 million cap uh, for the very first investor. You might be at a $6.5 million cap for the, for the last investor. Okay, we have a, a question here from Lenita, who, who may need to follow up with you separately because she, she's got you know a lot of questions in her specific instance, but I, I think it's relevant to the group. She said they're in due diligence with an angel group, and um, they said they preferred a price round over a convertible note. And she's saying we were advised earlier to do a convertible note and asking, should they push for the convertible note or will that affect their, the decision of, of the angel investors? I, I can't answer that without knowing who they are, but the, uh, the answer is probably it will affect the decision. There are, uh, there are some angel groups. There are certainly some angels, mostly, again, geographically based, um, who absolutely will not do a convertible deal no matter what. And it, it, if you push it to that level, um, they may very well walk away entirely. So if, if this is an investor that you really want to have, if they're making a pretty meaningful investment, so I'm hoping th this is this is you know this is closer to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars than it is to twenty five thousand dollars. It's probably going to be worth going ahead with an equity round. Now that doesn't mean that means that means one of two things: every other investor you bring in at this round will come in at the same terms, and you will be issuing equity all of them. Or this could be the only equity investor, and you're still going to do convertible notes with every uh, every other investor that comes in at this stage. Right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I know you can't answer specifically unless you know the group, but I think it's an interesting point of if you can push the convertible note or, or if they're resistant to it, you know, what are you going to do? Um, okay, also a question here. Can you um, transfer the convert so, note? Can you um, transfer the amount into the original business bank account you created or do you have to create a brand new bank account for that purpose well you probably can and certainly should transfer it only to your original corporate bank account the corporation will have a legal name a legal state of incorporation and a bank account that is tied to the employer identification number. That may, all of those things may be part of the diligence process for an investor, and they are going to issue cash to the company uh, under its corporate name, and you're going to deposit it in, into the account um, that, that that corporation under that corporate name opened. Okay, great. There, uh, there's a question here from Margo. I'm not sure I understand, but maybe you will. It said earlier, someone, uh, you said to add the investors to the cap table on the deck page. And she's asking, is this deck the pitch deck? Is this required or what were you referring to there? The cap table that you maintain um, by the company or that your lawyer maintains for the company. So uh, at every issuance, you should be updating the cap table that is being maintained on the company. It's, it, it's kind of an official document. Unlike um, with publicly traded securities, we don't have a custodian or a, an official transfer agent that maintains these records that is a third party. These kinds of records are maintained by the company. And so it, it is important to maintain the cap table up to date and the cap table will include the debt. Uh, yeah, probably on, on your pitch, uh, pitch deck, you'll be, you'll probably want to be telling, um, telling other potential investors who your investors are and, and, uh, but, but that doesn't have to, to be part of the cap table that you present to them. In fact, I wouldn't even put that in the pitch deck, um, um, uh, certainly in, in the early rounds of negotiations. Okay, great. Let's try and get through just a couple more and we won't push it past 1210. And we appreciate those of you folks who've stayed on. And if, you know, people dropped off, they'll get the recording tomorrow. So they'll be able to hear the answers to their questions. Um, Nancy's wondering, why wouldn't you provide a put for the borrower company to convert at a low fixed value set out in the CD instrument so that you don't have to worry about borrowing from, you know, those Midwesterners? <laughs> So can you read that again? Sure, I, and maybe it will make more sense sure. to you. <laughs> and maybe it will make more sense to you. <laughs> Why wouldn't you provide a put for the borrower company to convert at a low fixed value that's set out in the CD instrument 
and then doing so then you doing would so avoid having to borrow from you know the people in the middle of the country who may have different ideas Well, it's it's very difficult to get. Um, if I'm fully understanding your question, it's very difficult to get to get borrowing, to get loans from uh, any entity that is in the business of making loans, unless you've got two years of, or in some cases, three years of uh, track record. Um, so even companies, banks, lenders that tout their small business loans still are looking for two years of track record. When it comes to trying to create um, and issue derivative instruments to investors, it, it becomes a, a more complex process, one that will certainly involve more lawyers on both sides. And more lawyers always means more money and more time uh, to negotiate. Uh, and, and, you know, in any time an investor sees a process that is a little bit un unusual, um, it, it's a speed bump and will cause the investor to step back uh, to, to invest much more reluctantly, much more slowly if at all, and um, to take a lot more time to think through and make sure that he or she understands the transaction entirely. I, I, I always recommend uh, um, eliminating every speed bump you can. And if that doesn't fully answer the question, I'm happy to, to, to follow up on email. Okay. No, I think that's helpful. Um, Colin wants to know, do investors require a rigorous statement of how the funds will be spent and what milestones will be reached? Yeah, it totally depends on the investor. They ought to. Um, and you ought to, you ought to have some good sense of it. You know, and, and it doesn't have to be really detailed, but, uh, but you ought to have a pretty good sense of, uh, of how you, or why you're raising money. I mean, why, why do you need to, to raise the funds and what are you going to spend it on? And, you know, a, a simple quick way to do that is to produce something like a sources and uses statement, which just says, uh, we're, we're trying to raise $575,000 and we're, we're, we're aiming right now at spending 150,000 bucks on development and, and $200,000 on, on hiring sales and marketing and uh, the rest for uh, operating costs. You know, I'm totally making this up, but, but something like that, uh, you, you don't typically need to be and go into more detail than that. Right, right. Okay. Um, do Series A investors ever try to buy out note holders? Is that possible? Sure, they do. Um, and um, you, you might even like that. Uh, you know, it depends. If you've got, um, you know, you've got a couple of investors at 25,000 bucks and they happen to be sort of prickly, the kind who call you up every month wanting to know what you've been doing for the last month, you might well want to get rid of them. Um, and, uh, and this is a great opportunity to do it. You might also find some investors, um, are really happy, you know, the, to, 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 to cash out at this point. Uh, you know, they're looking for the liquidity. So it might even be a good financial deal from their point of view, um, to be able to cash out. But nobody is required, you're not required to cash them out, and they are not um, permitted, contractually speaking, to demand it. Great. Thank you so much. I, you know, I think we got through the, the bulk of the questions here, um, and so I'm going to leave it there. You folks can see the contact information. So again, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to follow up with Kevin um, and with Gadiel. And Gadiel, thanks for joining us too. Sorry, I, I know we have a lot of clients who deal with these convertible note scenarios all the time, so I, I'm sorry there was so much content to get through that we didn't have much of a time to hear your voice, but we appreciate you being on the call. Um, and just a quick plug um, that we have two great webinars coming up next week. Um, on May 12th, we have Ask the VC How to Create a Winning Pitch Deck with Mark Phillips from RFR Adventures. And that's going to be an hour worth of Q&A of you guys just asking questions about pitching and, and having real answers from a real VC. Um, and then on May 13th, we're doing one with Mary Juton from Tracklight about is your business at risk? And it's 10 tips to manage risk and minim um, sorry manage risk and maximize value. So um, we hope you'll be able to join us for those or other upcoming webinars. You can go to our website and check out our events page for more information or to register. Um, again, Kevin, who knew that convertible notes were so interesting, right? <laughs> we, we really appreciate you taking the time to educate us all. And uh, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.